let's get into our study. We're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 12, as we continue our series here in the book of 1 Peter. And so I'll read verses 4 through 8, though I'm going to cover up to verse 12. I'll give you a brief reminder, and we'll move into our study. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 4, reading to verse 8. The Apostle Peter writes, Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. They stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. So Peter has been speaking in his letter, and he had just shared with the believers that they had purified their souls, he says, in obeying the gospel. Purified souls. When he speaks about them purifying their souls, it speaks of what we would call today a moral cleansing. It speaks of an inward sanctification. And and he's saying that the soul purification is the result of being cleansed. And he had said this in verse 19, by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, John, in 1 John uh, chapter 1, verse 9, had said it like this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so our souls have received what is called a moral purification, an inward sanctification through the obedience to the gospel in receiving Christ, who is the one who purges us, who cleanses us. And because we've been born again and because we have been purified and all of that, we can now love one another and we can do it fervently and we can do it with purified hearts. Now, he had says we can love one another fervently. That, that word fervently simply means deeply and completely. It speaks of intensely. And so he had pointed out that if believers love one another, we'll demonstrate it by our life, by the way that we live. So we lay aside various sins, especially those sins that affect other people, what we call body life. We put aside malice. And I shared with you that that, that's uh, ill will. It's it's something that destroys fellowship. He said we put aside guile. It's pretending to be uh, somebody's friend, and you secure information about them, and then you use it against them. He spoke about hypocrisy, which is a pretense or insincerity. He spoke about putting aside envy. It's that attitude behind hypocrisy. It's usually associated with party strife, getting people together in opposition to others. And then he said, we put aside evil speaking, and I mentioned to you that that is gossip. It's it's criticizing someone when they're not present. And the point is, if we're going to love one another fervently, that we stay away from these sins because they destroy the Christian church. It's the open and the honest loving of the truth that will bind us together. And so He's pointed out that our hunger for the Lord and his word reveals that we actually are his children. And as his children, we desire the spiritual nourishment, he says, that comes from the word of God. As as newborn babes, we desire the sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby. And so that's how our lives change. It comes through hunger, it comes through instruction, and it comes through application of the word of God. Now, there's a, a, a devotional writer that I like. His name is A.W. Tozer. And Tozer said, Our Lord told his disciples that love and obedience were organically united. And the final test of love is obedience. And that's why in John 14, 15, Jesus would say, If you love me, keep my commandments. In John 15, 12, he said, This is my commandment, that you love one another. He said, Even as I've loved you. And so he's been laying this foundation for us as we approach verse 4. And he begins at that point by simply saying, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. Coming to him is a phrase that illustrates 
how we were saved. We heard the gospel. We received the invitation. We came to him. We became his followers. It's like what it says in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, Isaiah 45, verse 22, where God says, look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. I am God. There is no other. Look to me and be saved. Coming unto him is the way that Peter is putting it here. We have come to him. We've received the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus in Matthew 11, 28 through 30 said it like this. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. And so we came to him. Now notice in verse 4, notice how he says, coming to him as the living stone. Living, well, obviously, he speaks of his life. He's alive. He's the source of life for all of his followers. I am the way, he said, the truth, and the life. And so he is our life, and he's that source of life. In, in John eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus said to, to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life, and he who believes in me, though he may die, yet he shall live. In Revelation 1, 18, I am he who lives, was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. So he's the living stone. He's the source of all life. He's the stone. He's the foundation. When it says that he's that living stone, Jesus is the foundation stone on which the church is built and the church rests. In Matthew 7, 24, he has said like this, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. He had compared that with the man who builds his house on the sinking sand. And so when Peter is speaking here, he's saying, we are coming to the one who is life, and we are building a life on this one who cannot be shaken. And so he's that foundation stone of the church. And so he points out something about the living stone. Notice how he speaks of him in this way. He says, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected, Indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. He was rejected by men. So the word rejected, those of you in construction will, will know what this term means. The word rejection speaks of the building inspector who comes and looks at the construction and disapproves of it. We've had that here more than once. Where they'll come and they'll see something, and they, they're very meticulous, these inspectors, and they have their little clipboard and their pencil, and they go through everything, and then they mark the things off that need to be checked and fixed. And so he was rejected. In other words, people examined him and found him wanting, found him lacking. They didn't want this Christ. They rejected him. They rejected him, and you see it in the Gospels with Jesus, because he didn't fit into their religious plans. They had plans for salvation, and he didn't fit into their plans. So they rejected the plan. In John 1, 10 and 11, John said it like this. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world didn't recognize him. He came to that which was his own. He came to his own nation, but his own, his own subjects, his own people did not receive him. They rejected him. And in Luke 17, 25, it spoke of Messiah who must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And so because of this, they, he didn't fit into the plans. And by the way, he still doesn't. He still doesn't fit into the religious plans that people have. And because of this, he was rejected. It's that rejection that resulted in his crucifixion. And it was revealed when Jesus stood before Pilate. Remember in Matthew chapter 27, verses 20 through 22, how it says, the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas. And destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, What then shall I do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? And they all said to him, Let him be crucified. And so he is this, this living stone that has been rejected. But though he was rejected by men, notice again in verse 4, he was chosen by God and he's precious. So God chose Jesus, and he has made him the Savior of the world. And he didn't, you might want to remember this, he didn't choose anyone else. He didn't choose anyone else. God chose Jesus. In Acts 4.12, it 
There is salvation in no one else. There is no other name in all of heaven for people to call on to save them. And so Jesus, though rejected by men, is chosen by God. God has chosen him. Now, we can be rejected. I won't say this too long. But we can be rejected. You know, when you get saved, not everybody throws a party. You know, they don't kill the fatted calf and invite all the friends to come on over. My son who was lost has now been found. You know, a lot of times they're very upset. Not always, but a lot of times they're very upset. I can handle you when you were an alcoholic, but I can't handle you as a Christian. You know, you're embarrassing me and the family. Look at, we raised you right. I mean, I've heard those things. We raised you right. <laughs> yeah, that's why I was an alcoholic. You know, we raised you right. That's why I was as evil as I was. No, no, I was just a, a sinner just like you, and I needed to get saved. That's how it works. But Jesus is the only one. He's the one that we find salvation is. And even though we can be rejected, uh, one of my favorite psalms that speak about this in verse 10 of, chapter, of Psalm 27, it says, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. And so we're never rejected by God. He says Jesus is precious. That word precious is, is a word that speaks of his, his, his honor, that his, he's preeminent. He's very prized. It speaks of his unspeakable value, his unspeakable worth to God and to us. Now, this one, he says in verse 5, that you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Jesus, the living stone, but we together are being conformed into his image. It, it, it's, it speaks of us being in union with one another and being built upon him. We're a spiritual house that God has built for himself, a house, if you will. The church is his house. And what we are are building blocks for the house of God. The house is the church, and the church is also portrayed in Scripture as God's temple. And so you are the temple of the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you, and as his house, as that dwelling place of the spirit and all, we have been built up. And what happens is we are also referred to as a holy priesthood. Now, let me develop this for just a moment with you. In Jesus, every believer is regarded as a priest. In the Old Testament, God desired this for the nation of Israel. You see it in Exodus, in chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. If you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. And so this holy nation is fulfilled in the church. We have become the holy priesthood of believers. So as a priest, we have access to God. As priests, we, we serve him personally. And as priests, we minister to other people. As priests, we offer up sacrifices, but we don't offer up dead sacrifices because Jesus was offered once for all time. We offer living sacrifices, sacrifices of praise, sacrifices of service, sacrifices of gratitude because God saved us. It's like what it says in Hebrews 13, 15, and 16. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. So he's telling us what we are. We are people who have put aside sins, certain sins that he had outlined in, in verse 1 of chapter 2. We have become the, the, the household, if you will, the place that God resides by his spirit. And we've become priests, and so we serve. We serve other believers. We also serve uh, humanity in general. Galatians 6.10 says, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. And so this is what we've been built up to, a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. We offer up spiritual sacrifice that are acceptable to God. 
through Jesus. And therefore, verse 6, it is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. And so when he speaks concerning this, and he actually, all the way to verse 8, he continues on to give various scriptures. He's, he's speaking of uh, th things that are found in the Old Testament. He quotes Isaiah 28 and Psalm 118 and Isaiah uh, chapter 8. But I want you to see something here, and it'll just take a moment. But he says, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Um, chief cornerstone. We need to remember that Jesus is the chief foundational stone. And we need to remember that when the Apostle Peter was speaking to Jesus in, in uh, Caesarea, uh, Philippi, how when Jesus had said to him, who, who do men said to his men, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? We need to remember that the Apostle Peter was quick to respond. Remember how he said, Jeremiah, some say you're Jeremiah, some say Elijah, some say John the Baptist, others one of the prophets. And remember how Jesus responded, how Jesus said to him, um, but who do you say I am? You know, and it, it, I've taught that passage in Caesarea Philippi many times. And we're there looking at the site and general area where Jesus would have actually had that conversation with his men. And he had said, who do you say that I am? Because he wanted the men to know um, that they could, be, they could be affected by the common uh, conversations related to Christ, even as we can to this day. If you ask people, who is Jesus Christ, you'll get a lot of different responses. But a genuine Christian is going to say he's my Savior. He's the second person of the most holy trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He has convicted me of my sin by his Spirit. He provided salvation for me when he died on the cross. He died, he was buried, but he was resurrected the third day. And uh, after 40 days, he ascended into heaven. He sent the Holy Spirit to dwell within those. We know those certain aspects of what it means to be a follower of Christ because every Christmas and every Easter even uh, the United States, as pagan as we've become over the years, uh, it, it, they still remember at least by name that there's one named Jesus Christ. But for us, he's much more than that, right? I mean, he is the chief cornerstone. So when, when uh, Jesus was speaking to him, uh, he said, Blessed are, are you, Simon, uh, son of Jonah. Flesh and blood did not re reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven did. And he said, I say unto you that you are... You are Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church. Now, many people are confused by that, but what Jesus was doing is he was speaking concerning the fact that the confession of faith that Peter had made, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, is the foundation of the reality of being born again. It's knowing Christ. So Peter is not that foundational stone. He's not the chief cornerstone. He's the one who recognized the one who is. And in 1 Peter, he's making it very clear. In Matthew, in 20, chapter 21, verses 42 through 44, Jesus said, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone? The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but... He on whom it falls will be crushed. So those who reject Jesus, he says, are the ones who have stumbled over him like a stone that has been placed in their path and they're walking and they walk in darkness. They're not going to see it. They're going to stumble and trip over him. It's interesting how he puts it, though. Notice how it says in verse 7, Therefore to you who believe he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, a, stu a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. So, disobedient. When he uses the word disobedient there, they stumble, verse 8, being disobedient. Verse 7, but to those who are disobedient, to be disobedient means to know that you've been commanded to do something and you refuse to. 
And so he's speaking of those who have rejected Christ, those who refuse to receive Jesus. And what happens is they stumble over him in rejecting Christ. That's all that is left to them. Stumbling is all you can do if you refuse to receive Jesus as Messiah. But he said that hasn't been the case with you because in verse 9, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. You are a chosen generation. Now, when he speaks of that, he's contrasting obedience and disobedience. And what he's doing here, and, and Christian, this is a very important portion of Scripture. In this, he's telling us who we are. This tells you who you are. Peter is telling you, there are so many people, we used to call it an identity crisis. I just don't know who I am. You know, I woke up this morning and looked around this empty room, and I saw emptiness in my, my own heart. And then I went and looked in the mirror, and I saw emptiness in my eyes. I just don't know who I am. Shut up. I can tell you who you are. <laughs> You're dumb. Who are we? That's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question. Who are we? Uh, there was a German philosopher who was sitting in this, this park. And a man approached him and he said to him, he said to him, who are you? And the philosopher said in response, that's what I've been sitting on this bench trying to figure out. Who am I? If there's anything this, uh, this society that we're living in right now needs to know, it's who they are. And I think especially, this is especially pertaining to us, the believers, because you need to know that you've been born again if you're a Christian. You need to know that you're a new creation, that old things have passed away, that behold, all things have become new. You need to know that you're an heir of heaven. You need to know that you're a child of God. You need to know that you've been forgiven of all your sins. You need to know that the past is dead, but life in Christ is now. You need to know where your home is. It's not here. We're just passing through. Our, is, our home is in heaven with Jesus Christ. You need to know these things. Uh, this is so important that many of us forget. We get so caught up with the now that we are not even planning for the then. We're not even aware of that. We live as if this world is all we're ever going to have. But Peter's already said, you're sojourners, you're pilgrims, you're just passing through. The earth is not your home. You're just passing through. Don't hold on to everything like that, that wrestler, that famous wrestler back in the early 1800s, late 1800s who, who had gone to, uh, to Europe to wrestle in various, champion, various uh, um, matches. And he won a lot of uh, gold and had a gold belt. And uh, he put all his gold dust in a belt, and he was on a, a transatlantic uh, ocean liner on his way back to the United States when the, uh, the ocean liner began to sink. And when it began to sink, that's when the man uh, had his gold belt, and he jumped overboard to try and save himself, and the gold was so heavy it took him to the bottom, and he died. There are so many people who will give up everything for that which does not last. You've got to know who you are. And that's what, uh, what Peter's doing here. He's telling you, you're a chosen generation. God has chosen you. It is God's loving initiation. And he's brought you to himself. You're born again. You purified your souls. He said, through obedience, you've tasted of the Lord. You're being built up as a spiritual house. You're that chosen generation. You're elect of God. You belong to him. You're a royal priesthood. You're a household of priests. You're a a holy nation. Uh, God has set us apart for his use. And worship and honor. Uh, we are to worship and honor the only true and living God. And we abstain from those things that he hates. We're a royal priesthood. We're his own special people. We belong to him. We belong to him alone. And he loves us. Well, yesterday, my grandson, David Aaron, and my granddaughter, Isabella, um, were promoted from their um, homeschool classes. And I was sitting in an auditorium, Marie and I and the family, in an auditorium. 
And I'm just sitting there. And then I hear the name David Rosal. And I, I'll all of a sudden, yeah, you know, that's mine. And then my Bella gave a speech, which was the most amazing, greatest speech I've ever heard. <laughs> and once again, as a proud grandfather, I said, that one's mine. You know that God looks at you that way? Much more than I could ever, but do you know he says that about you? That one's mine. That one belongs to me. I think it's beautiful. The idea that my heavenly father claims me as his own has changed my life. It's transformed me because he's not ashamed to call me his. He loves me. He loves you. And that's all. It's very basic. But what he's done is he called us his own special people. We belong to him. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the spirit? who's in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. And so we're his special people who proclaim the praises of him. Notice who called us out of darkness. So what we do, we proclaim, we publish abroad the mighty works of God because we're his witness. We have been rescued from heathen darkness, from idolatry, from ungodly superstition, In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. So we've been saved through the word of God by the Holy Spirit working together and bringing us to him. We, We lived, he said, in spiritual darkness, but we've been brought into his light. In Colossians 1.13, he rescued us from the dominion of darkness. He brought us into, into the kingdom of the Son he loves. And why is that? So that we may proclaim praise to him. That's so unusual. For people who unashamedly will say, I am the Lord's and he is mine. I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of being a Christian. Some people are. Oh, you don't want to admit it. You know, the press and so many negative things have been said about Christians for so long in such a constant fashion that it makes you almost, well, some people get embarrassed and ashamed. And that's one of the, um, one of the chief devices of the enemy is to, to make you ashamed. But I, I remember Jesus who said, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. And so I don't want to shrink back from him. And that doesn't mean that you're aggressive and that doesn't mean that you go out starting arguments and that doesn't mean that you hunt down people you don't agree with and argue with them. It doesn't mean any of that. What it means is, is that you just love the Lord. And, and people will see that. And when they see that, there's something different about you. They may even go so far as to ask you, what is it that has made you different? There are people who will meet you, and they'll say, so you're, a, you're one of those born-againers? And you go, yeah, yeah. well, you know what? I've met a, a few of you. I've never liked your, uh, your group, uh, but you're different, you know? And maybe that's true. Maybe they've met some obnoxious believers. Sometimes we can be. But I, I've tried to, as I've grown older, I've tried to make sure I don't bring dishonor to the name of the Lord. And I've tried to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've asked the Lord to help me to have a heart of compassion and concern for people and to be in love with people, to to help them because because they're lost, because they're in bondage, because that they walk in darkness, they stumble. You know, and we've been given the light of life. We have the gospel that produces light in their life. We have been given the Holy Spirit who has enlightened our darkened eyes and all. And that's all he's saying. We're the people of God. We've been formed to bring praise and glory to him. And that's what we do. In Isaiah 43, 21, it says, This people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. And that's how God intends to reveal to people salvation. He does it through the body of Christ most often. Notice how he said in verse 10, we were once not a people, but are now the people of God. We were once outside of God's favor because we were rebellious, we were in sin, we disobeyed. This would include both Jew and Gentile. At one time, we had not obtained mercy, but now because of Christ, we have. 
And, and we've become his spiritual house. We are now changed into a holy priesthood. And, and as God's people, we can now approach him through Jesus. You know, when you were, before you were a Christian, I don't know if you had full confidence that God was answering your prayer, but my prayers as a, an unbeliever when they were given it infrequently, I didn't pray that much when I got older. I didn't believe in a God. But I remember on occasion, I'd remember the faith of my childhood that my mom had tried to impart to me. And on occasion, I would pray and I'd say, God, help me, or God this or God that. But I had no confidence he was listening. It was kind of like a shotgun prayer. You know, you just, just fire into the air and hope that it hits something, right? And that maybe God will do something. That's how I was. But after I got saved and I was being taught how the Bible tells us in, in Hebrews 4.16, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy, find grace to help us in our time of need. Now, now because of Jesus Christ, you can approach the, that throne of grace, whereas before you couldn't approach. The priests could not go into the holy of the holiest. They couldn't do that without blood, and they did that once a year. And there's a traditional teaching that when the priest would go in to present the blood, they're in the holiest of holy places, they're in the temple, that they would put a rope around him, and they had bells. And so if he walked in and he did something to offend God and died, they would have to just drag him out because they would hear the bells would stop ringing. You know, and, and that shows you the, the holiness of God and the fear of man as it pertains to the holiness of God. But now you with confidence. Can, now that doesn't speak of arrogance. What it speaks of, it, it speaks of the certainty that Christ has made the way possible for me so through him I can approach. Through Christ. I don't come in my own merit. You don't either. How could we? We're, all of our sins are, are, are putrid in his sight. So we come through the blood of Christ and that's what he's been saying. Jesus made it possible for you to call him Father. And before you were just a rebellious person, and now you're his son, and we approach him. So have confidence. Know that you can. Now he goes on to say in verses 11 and 12, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles. Now notice this, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. I beg you, I plead with you, I beseech you, I'm very serious as I say this to you. I'm begging you as sojourners. Uh, a sojourner is a, a stranger, it's an alien, somebody who's in a foreign land. Uh, I speak to you as a pilgrim, uh, one who has come into a country to reside in, but never becomes a citizen. Um, I'm begging you in this way. Remember, the earth isn't your home. Remember that you're just passing through. Remember that your hope is in heaven and that our home is with Jesus and that he went before us to prepare a place for us and if he went before us to prepare a place for us, he said, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So he's gone ahead of us. And that's why we are confident, according to 2 Corinthians 5, 8, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So as sojourners and as pilgrims, notice he says, abstain from fleshly lusts. That word abstain, refrain from voluntarily. Now, fleshly lusts are the kinds of things that he had spoken of in, in verse 1. Jesus in Mark 7, 21 and 22 had said, For from within, out of a person's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. Foolishness is recklessness, it's senselessness. He said, put these things aside. Remove the old life. Live the new one in the power of the Spirit. Have your conduct honorable. The word honorable speaks of something beautiful. Your life can be a beautiful life because of the purity of your heart. We live a different kind of life. And these lives that we live will undermine the accusations of opponents of the gospel. Now, I'll close with this. Notice how he says, 
in verse 12, they speak against you as evildoers. That was taking place 2,000 years ago. That's taking place now. I don't know. Some of you don't watch the news. I've asked the church before, do you watch the news? And a lot of people don't. You know, I find that interesting. But a lot of people don't. But if you're, if you're, if you've got a pulse and you have a job or you're ever around people who aren't Christians, you will see it. It's not, it's not hidden. It's, it, its mask has been taken off. You are the enemy. You are Americans, and you're the great Satan. And you, as Christians, are the enemy. And, and there are many people who say that. Now, in the early church, in the early history of the church, remember with me, that the early church underwent persecution. We've been going through the book of Acts, and you've seen the Apostle Paul and his, his, uh, his ministry all the way from his earliest days in, in, in Christ in chapter 9 all the way through the book of Acts. You see that he suffered a lot of persecution. Jesus had prepared us for this. But there was a great amount of persecution. I don't have the time now to go through some of the things that happened, but the persecution was so severe you can't believe it. Uh, one example, I'll give you one example of what was taking place right around the time that this was written was that Caesar Nero hated Christians. And there was a great persecution. It's called the first persecution. There were ten, a series of ten persecutions that took place uh, in the history of the church up into uh, the, the fourth century. And the first, uh, the first persecution came through uh, Caesar Nero, and in the persecutions, they would, they, would, they, they would take Christians and they would put them on skillets and they would drop you on the skillet and roast you to death or they would put you inside of an iron animal. They would lift the lid. They would have fire underneath it until it was hot. Have you ever burned your hand on the, on the iron um, and they would drop the Christian in there and they would die that way. The, the persecution and the deaths that are recorded in history are so barbaric that we don't even speak of them. And that's what happened. And under Nero, there was a, a systematic extermination and persecution of believers. And so what they did during that day, and I'm, I'll develop this some other time, but when it says they speak of you as evildoers... They called us cannibals. I don't know if you know that. We were called cannibals. You know why? It's because we received communion, which we referred to as the type of, a picture of, we're going to have communion tonight, the body and blood of Christ. So they said Christians are cannibals. They eat human flesh. They called us incestuous because we married fellow Christians. Now, what do you call a, a woman or a man, brother or a sister? So because they would say, my sister, in reference to the spiritual connection, they said, you guys are committing incest. That was a charge. They called you an evildoer because that. They called you a destroyer of families. And the reason you were a destroyer of families is because if a, a woman and a man were married and one of them got saved, Especially if the woman got saved. We'll see this in chapter 3. If a woman got saved, what would happen is a husband would divorce her because she was not to exercise her own will to make determinations of the God she would serve. And so you were destroying families. They would refer to you in that way. They spoke of you as being an atheist. And the reason you were an evildoer, atheist, is because you would not bow your knee to the variety of gods the Romans would worship. And because you had the one God and refused to worship the others, they would call you atheists. And so these were the things that were being said. That's what he's referring to. But notice what he says. He says that they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God. He's saying by your lives you're going to reveal the true character of a believer. Guys, every time you're in your neighborhood, every time you're on the job site, wherever you are, always remember this. You are a representative of the kingdom of God. Everywhere you go.
go everywhere. You will be surprised at the people who will recognize you when you don't recognize them. You'll be surprised. I'm not that surprised because I stand up here in front of people all the time. But it happens all the time. Marie and I will be, somebody will, it happened just yesterday at the graduation. If I may, this sounds weird. It almost sounds self-promoting, but I'm trying to make a point. I, didn't, I don't run around with a collar and I don't have Pastor David on my shirt. You know, I just go like everybody else. And Marie and I were walking out of the ceremony yesterday, the graduation promotion ceremony. And a young lady approached me, and Marie, but approached me out in the very front. And she starts to talk to me. Hi, Pastor David. I, I didn't recognize her. I did and I didn't. You know what I mean? I mean, you can see some. I say, I know I've seen you somewhere. Were you on America's Most Wanted? No. <laughs> but I, I read. And, and she began to share with me. Just for a moment, she said, I've grown up in your church. And she started to cry. She said, and I was touched by this. I thought, it's amazing that, that, that she feels that strongly. People recognize you when you don't recognize them. They, they, they know you. I saw that one in church. I remember somebody telling me, you know, on Wednesday night after the Bible study, I went to grab a hamburger, and I was at this particular place up the road. He said, some of the people from the Bible study were sitting there drinking, some, drinking their beers and this and that. And I said, oh, really? People recognize you. They see you. And they'll, they'll make judgment whether they should or shouldn't. They do. It's one of the reasons why I'm aware of where I'm at at all times. I am. I have been on airplanes where I'm walking through, and somebody says, I was in church today. I saw you when I was in another state. I, I've... I, I wish I could talk to you now. I can't. I have to do communion. It just happens all the time. I'm always aware, and you need to be aware too. And you have unbelievers. You've told. I'm a Christian. Do not think they ignore you. Don't think they ignore you. I'm not saying you should be paranoid and be looking over your shoulder every time you're walking around. I'm simply saying, once you open your mouth, you're on trial. Your faith is on trial. And they'll watch you. And then they may come up to you and say, you know, this God that you worship, I've seen how it's changed your life. I see the way that you live. That's what Peter's talking about. That they may glorify God on the day of visitation because you lived an open life for Christ and you made an impact. So it gives us an entrance to share the reason for the hope that we have in Christ. Because living lives that glorify him, guys, remember brings honor to him, and demonstrates that we've been saved.